Welcome everyone to the Conscious Woman podcast. Uh, today, I'm excited to be speaking to Tanuj Pojwani, who is the author of The Art of Bitfulness, which he has co-authored with Nandan Nilikani. Tanuj, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. I'm really excited to speak to you about how we can all be a lot more mindful in our use of technology. Uh, thank you, Bhavna, for having me here, and hello to the audience. Uh, Bhavna has been kind enough to accommodate my last-minute request, uh, and thank you all for joining. I'm hoping to have a very interesting conversation as well. I was um, so uh, delighted and honored to be part of the Conscious Women Summit, which I have to say was very well organized, and the topics were uh, very interesting. So congratulations to you on that, Bhavna. Thank you so much, Sanoj. And one of the reasons why I wanted you on the podcast is because I think what the, some of the ideas that you talk about in this book are so, um, so in depth and they need a longer conversation, which at, in a panel discussion, honestly, we couldn't really do justice to. Um, so so let's, let's, let's get into that. Um, one of the first things I'd love to ask you is you have co-authored this book with Nandan Nilakeni, who we all know, uh, founder of uh, Infosys. Um, you are both a good three decades apart. And I love how in the book you even mention you got your first smartphone when you were 21 years old. Yeah. Nandan got his when he was 55. Yeah. And yet here you are, uh, you were, there was some, I'm, I'm guessing some shared pain that you both felt around the use of technology that brought you together to collaborate on this project. So I'd love to know what was that shared pain or even shared purpose, whatever you would want to call it. Um, for oh. the, the idea behind this book. So, I, so you're right that um, both shared pain and shared purpose. Um, the shared pain was surprising. And uh, how this happened was in the pandemic, I think all of us were behind screens and only talking to and meeting people that way. Um, and so was I. I've been working with London for a while. Um, but, uh, you know, I think London generally... Um, wanted to meet people in person as soon as the pandemic allowed it, as soon as we figured out that, okay, if you wear masks, maintain safe distance, meet outdoors, um, you can meet people. So in about, I would say July or August of 2020, uh, we started conducting these, uh, you know, he started conducting these walks in the park. We we're both in Kormangla and we used to meet around the park. Now, as opposed to say a Zoom meeting where if we, Manage to run out of things to talk about, we will disconnect, or more likely, we'll keep talking at the end of the hour. Um, in a park, if you you know if you had a certain piece of work and you finished it, you're still there, you're still walking, right? So uh, so both of us started, uh, you know, like we had a 45 minute thing because we had you know it was his exercise slot, so we had a 45 minute walking time period. We finished what we had to discuss in like 15 minutes, right? So now we have half an hour. Now what do you do? So. Um, so, you know, I, I obviously mentioned how nice it is to actually be out and meet somebody in person and talk to them and how, you know, it resolved in 15 minutes, whereas in an online meeting, you would have thought it would have taken a longer time. Um, and he was saying the same thing that, you know, he's, he's also felt a lot more engaged and productive and he's, um, he's here. And I had this thought that, wait, I, aren't you supposed to be this, you know, like tech genius, etc. I mean, you're also complaining about this. Um, and he had the same reaction to me. He said, you're young, right? Like, what if, you know, I thought you guys all like this Zoom stuff and like, you know, all of this, like, you know, literally speaks like that. He says that I thought that all of you guys would like this and I'm, you know, I was doing it because I didn't want to be excluded. Um, and, and we both realized that the shared pain is that when you're behind a screen, you don't actually form connections. You don't, uh, it's very tiring. Um, you know, I, um, I think that say what you will, but you get to know somebody a lot more through through nonverbal signals, through just sort of reading uh, their mood, etc. In person, and uh, while while technology can help us get past distance when we need to, um, I don't think it's our preferred way. Um, the shared passion, of course, for us was that um, the world is going digital. Look, one way or the other. Uh, even right now what we're working on is saying that India is going massively digital. Um, but what matters is sort of the shape of the economy or how we're going digital, right? Um, 
in the Western world, essentially, all of this has been monopolized. Everything is sort of coming together in the hands of a few companies. And we both care about that not happening for longer term outcomes. So, so the book is essentially a mix of these two. One is sort of your own personal habits and also, um, you know, um, what can we do about this larger trend in society? Yes. And the pandemic was so interesting in that sense, because on one hand, as you said, technology was one of the things that literally saved us and connected us when we had no other ways of connecting. But at the same time, it also made us painfully aware of how dependent we all are on technology uh, many times in, in not very healthy ways. And in fact, I'd love to cite some of the statistics that you actually share in the book, which frankly are frightening. The average user in India, you mentioned, according to one study, spends close to seven hours a day on their smartphones. 84% of users check their phones within five minutes of waking. The average user touches, taps, or swipes on their phones over 2,500 times, which is staggering. And here's the, the important thing. Over 70% of users agree that their mental and physical health will suffer if these current patterns of consumption continue and that they would be happier if they uh, use their phones less. So Tanuj, help us understand what has happened because technology was supposed to make our lives easier, make it more convenient. Yeah. How did we end up in such a toxic relationship using your own words yeah. uh, with, with our phones and technology in general? Um, I mean, I think uh, that, that's why I use those words, right? Toxic relationships, because it's the closest thing I know to something that we all have probably at some point experienced um, uh, where you know something's bad for you, but you can't help going back for more, right? Um, that, like you said, the most important statistic is 70% uh, of the people are fully aware that this is bad for them. They're not, they're under no, it's not like it's an awareness problem. People just don't understand that the choices they're making are bad for them. It's, it's like everybody can see the straight line from where they are and how they're using to bad relationships, bad health, uh, you know, lack of mental peace, um, yet we keep doing it. And, and this is honestly the question that we wanted to explore in the book. And, um, and I spoke to a lot of people and, and here is my summary, right? It, it's that your phone is not just an information device. It is not, um, it's not, you know, it's not a computer, but a smaller, it is not uh, whatever. It is genuinely, especially in the pandemic, it became entirely, uh, our connection to the outside world. It, 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 every piece of news that you get, right? Think about it. If your next job, are you going to get it or not? Um, uh, you know, whatever you're waiting for, maybe you really care about some art or some artist and some new album, right? Like uh, Taylor Swift's new album in, in the pandemic, right? She released two, which made me feel uh, even worse that I took two years to write a book while she can sort of you know, produce two albums in there. But anything you care about today comes through your phone. Um, your investments, your, you know, if you care about how much money you have, you're probably looking at your phone to check how they're doing. So that little glass and metal box that you carry around everywhere is literally the manifestation of all your anxieties, all your worries, everything that you're trying to control, everything you're trying to like do in life. Um, and it is hard not to form an emotional relationship then with that little magic box. Um, and, uh, and that's why, you know, things like um, you basically start like whenever you get up or something or whenever you're leaving a room, the first thing you do is pack your pockets and check it. You have your phone on you. Um, I mean, these are, these are absurd things. They rationally, they don't make any sense for us to do. Um, but we formed an emotional relationship with them, um, which is what we would like for people to pay attention to and say that, how have you reached here? Why have you reached here? And, uh, and does it really do what you think it does for you, right? Do you really think that having your phone on you and looking at it is, is actually going to increase your sense of control over your life uh, or change anything really? Or is it just putting you in a loop, right? Where you're anxious about money, you check your stocks every five minutes, not really going to make a difference. 
um, but you're still doing it. So, uh, so yeah, just bringing more attention to these ideas um, uh, is what we're trying for. But how did we get here? Honestly, it's it's um, it's the fact that just because we could do anything, you know, like sort of the phone promise that you could do anything anywhere at any time. And what we've done is we've confused that ability with the necessity, right? We now actually do everything everywhere all the time. You're with your friends and uh, you're sitting down and you're still checking Instagram as if somehow there's going to be something else in the world that's more important than right now. It's not going to be. It's so true. And, and in fact, I love uh, the way the concept you have coined in the book of really thinking of our phones as, a, as an extended mind. It's, it's yeah. really an extension of who we are, which is why we're so addicted and so attached to our devices, because we don't see it as, as something um, external. So the, Dhanuj, one of, one of the things I really liked in your book is when you really when we really look at this toxic relationship, we realize there are, there are several players that yeah. have sort of come together to create this perfect cocktail or crisis, uh, as you mentioned in the book, uh, and, and responsible for where we are today. And I'd love to talk about all of them one at a time. So you talk about the human brain, first and foremost, that is highly prone to distraction. So that's that's the first thing you talk, you talk about just the nature of the technology itself, which is so addictive. And then you talk also talk about just the system overall, the Silicon Valley startup yeah. world, which favors scale above all else that has also perpetuated the crisis that we're currently in. So let's talk about this one by one because each plays as you as you as you as you talk about in the book each plays such a significant role and maybe if we understand the role each plays we can make a little bit more progress in being more mindful or bitful as you say so start let's start with the brain how is our brain itself really getting in the way of us being more mindful in our use of technology so uh, so i love i love this part honestly because when you when you dig into it um, and you actually see what's happening and why are you so addicted. Um, let, let me start with the most common reaction that I got when I started talking to people about this before the book. Uh, the most common reaction I would get or the story that would be uh, told to me would be something like this, that, oh, I was doing, I was about to do something or, you know, I just finished doing something. I was about to do something else. So I decided I'm to pull out my phone and I'm going to look at Instagram in the meanwhile, right? Like, or just before starting a task, etc. And they would open their phone, they would say 501 or something, you're looking at your phone. And then suddenly they look up and it's like 531 or like, you know, it's 20 minutes have gone and you're like, oh no, how did, where did time go type thing. This is recurring. A lot of people say this happens. Um, now, to me, what's interesting is that, you know, this feeling of basically losing time, losing space, um, is, is this sort of you're in a trance or you've lost time or you know you were you're addicted is what you say you're scrolling you didn't realize it um, but the same feeling of absolute immersion right is what is also being called inflow and if you talk to say top athletes or you talk to people who are good like somebody who's painting in their craft and you know they'll say that when they're actually creating masterpiece or when they're doing something or like you know uh, when uh, uh, someone's having their record breaking run you ask them what they were going through, what they were feeling, you know, what were they thinking? They're like, we weren't thinking. We were, you know, our brains were absolutely quiet. We were completely immersed. Um, you know, all I could see was the ball or all I could see was, uh, you know, um, the other opponent or whatever. They're very focused on their own goal. These two states, really, the one where we are completely distracted by our phone and the one where we're completely immersed um, in, uh, in the task at hand, um, these are actually the same state, right, mentally. Uh, that basically you're in flow. Um, there is something, there's a simple loop that you've created, which is uh, there is a behavior, there's a reward to it. Um, and, you know, uh, there's a clear path of action between where you are and getting to a high score, etc. So in the case of scrolling, you, you go up, you're rewarded with, you know, you scroll down or scroll up, you're rewarded with new content. 
um, in say a tennis match or whatever you're you're playing your opponent and you know what counts as a serve as a win etc um, these states are very very similar and this is because the people who design these and you know we're getting into point two um, the people who design these apps actually look into this kind of behavior they look at what keeps casino you know people in casinos addicted to actually design these experiences for you so uh, all of us really what we are seeking is this state of immersion and and um, you know full engrossment and engagement in what we are doing the only difference is what are you doing in that state the the social media of the world would like you to be scrolling and buying and like you know just seeing their videos and listening to ads etc whereas what you would rather be doing would be more of your work or more of uh, you know whatever you're trying to create maybe as art um and the rules around them are very like you know the, the thing that engages you is very simple your brain is designed the same way um it is that can you avoid these traps of um uh, these games and then get into rather the ones that you want which is what is called flow and so we have a chapter on um, how do you go about sort of designing flow in your work life right yes absolutely and and which really takes us also to the third thing which i think you talk about powerfully in your book which is it's 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 not just us that is responsible for the current state that we're in and so let's not also put all of the responsibility on ourselves to get us out of this crisis there is a whole machinery there's a whole system that has literally created this crisis so help us understand when we look at the collective which which you which you talk about quite powerfully looking at the individual responsibility as well as the collective responsibility what are some things we should be aware of there uh i think to me the the biggest challenge right now is that um is cultural right like what what's happened is that i i used to uh, in fact we're trying to put this number together but you know back in the day back in 99 2000 uh, people coming out of engineering colleges almost all of them wanted to go abroad right like uniformly um none of them wanted to stay um by the late 2000s this was speaking but then there were some jobs some say you know jobs in finance or consulting or some other places uh, where uh, people wanted to stay right and it services also came along and people wanted to stay for a while um i would say by 2009 10 when the the crisis happens and now people don't want to go abroad as much if you go back to campuses today and you ask people what they want to do they all want to start startups everybody just wants to be the next uh, elon musk or uh, what have you um and i find and you know this last year we've seen shark tank come on the tv we've seen um, uh, you know just just the news most of the ipos this year have been tech um so basically startups have become this culture right um and in this culture there is only one sort of underlying figure that matters which is that you know how big you are what's your valuation right um and and it's strange that things across categories are compared in that same breadth right like uh, a financial services firm or fintech firm is deals it's in the business of money at very low margins so if you take their top line numbers they're obviously going to be you know uh, at least tens of billions of dollars if not hundreds of billions of dollars because they're making about 60 bips right they're making 0.6% on that or less than that um and therefore their top line numbers are different right and e-commerce thing is you're actually selling right but like the value add and what you do and your cost structures are very different but they're all compared on the mantle of this you know valuation number which is becoming uh quite frankly ridiculous right it's it has it says nothing about are we in a good society it says nothing about is are people uh, being treated fairly it says nothing about you know are we treating our environment our resources uh, uh, you know fairly are uh, is the growth equitable right it might grow big but is everybody getting uh, an equal part of the share um take this instant grocery thing right which really uh, um uh, gets into my nerves because frankly 
that instant grocery startup will no longer be an instant grocery. I already yesterday, uh, when I actually needed for once mushrooms uh, to make a soup on time, it was saying 23 minutes, right? So that whole under 10 minute promise is not something that I'm actually going to deliver on consistently. Um, they just wanted to sort of, you know, um, uh, create that buzz around it. Um, but when you do that, there are lives you put at risk, right? There's, there's precarity that people like me who will be, you know, executives in those organizations are not the ones who have to bear that precarity, right? Their, their only risk is they'll get a very comfortable salary, but like will their ESOPs really turn into billions or millions of dollars or not, right? Like that's the only risk they carry, which frankly is not much of a risk. Um, these structures perpetuate because ultimately there is a certain class and category of people who get rich from this, right? Um, and which is why capital is so freely available to this model. Because, you know, an investor gets more rich when something becomes the new Facebook, but not when Facebook becomes, you know, better for society. So, um, so I mean, that's... I don't want to make it sound too simplistic because there is, and that's what we've done in the book. There is various factors. Each of these people are acting honestly in a way that you can't chide any one person for. But when you step back and you look at the system, you have to ask, is this system really going to deliver the good outcomes for society that we all care about? Um, and the answer is no, because um, essentially what most of them care about is being able to capture the platform, right? Like so, so like search. Um, there's only one search engine left, right? And uh, uh, I was listening to a statistic somewhere that said that on the Google search result today, like for certain categories of items, like you search for a flight, um, forty-eight percent or something of the screen that you see are all Google products. So you'll see a Google paid search result, then you'll see Google answers, then you'll see Google flight. You know, their own widget showing their own flight, etc. So imagine that, right? Like of billions of people ask trillions of questions and like in every single um, answer, 48% or so of our attention is captured by one company, right? They're literally getting to decide what we think. Um, same happens in social, um, similar things will happen, you know, in, in other places. And this is the playbook. All, all Silicon Valley uh, sort of companies are aiming to monopolize an entire segment and become the market, right? Um, this does not lead to good outcomes. I mean, historically, we have enough proof and more to show that every time there's a monopoly, uh, innovation stifles, new prices will come in. The internet itself would not have come in if at and had not been broken up uh, because, you know, everybody was fine with things the way they were. Uh, because there's only one company, people did not know any better. So uh, the basic problem here is that the, the financial model of building new startups, the culture of wanting to be the biggest and the you know most valued startup, all of this combines into one particular type of company or startup only being appreciated. Everything else does not. Um, this is, is to me the heart of the problem. Till we get out of this, we are not going to see a diverse, resilient economy. We are going to see more and more of these giants trying to capture everything in one place. Yes, absolutely. And to be honest, this is the part I am I'm still struggling with because on one hand, as you said, if we only look at what we can do as individuals, we're really only fixing the symptoms. We're not getting to the root cause. And as you said, the culture or the system is really the root cause. But this culture now is so deeply entrenched and unlikely to change anytime soon. What hope do we have? And I want to be optimistic about this. So, uh, yeah. um, so I, think, I think the answer is the following, right? That... Um, over time, uh, this might be nuanced right now, but uh, I, I, I have hope um, that as consumers, as individuals, we can get start getting smarter about these things. So I think today it is understood as much as Apple is still the dominant phone in many markets, including the US, 
it is understood that apple is not really going to make products that are necessarily uh, you know economical for you it is uh, it is now a running joke that you know if, if apple won't even sell you like they'll sell you the charger also for your phone separately right like it's they they're like even that is going to be an additional cost etc so first of all i i have faith that consumers can start identifying bad business practices what earlier would have been seen as innovative or something new uh, give it enough time people understand where things are uh, not in their best interest and then it starts becoming a politically sort of uh, fraught move to do something of that sort right and we've seen this um, a lot with um, say say single use plastics right or packaging like we've seen that wasteful packaging while it is much easier for for companies it helps their quality processes and and you know returns and all of that uh, but it is just becoming you know as it enters a consciousness of consumers um, companies have to respond right um and i think what the what we wanted to do with this book and the conversation we wanted to have is that hey there is a very very specific kind of design pattern um in when it comes to designing a tech monopoly uh which if we can pay attention to when you see which companies are on the wrong side of this divide right we can all start making choices and you know it really puts that pressure on companies to to be faithful to this idea now what is this what is this idea that i'm talking about um so the internet itself right why it became so popular was because it was an open network an open network means that you know anybody could come and build off it nobody really owned it nobody permission like you didn't have to go uh, you know get a sign off from anybody to start something on the internet this is why the internet was weird it was innovative it was crazy and then it started having so much happening because you don't have to go to somebody and say hey can i please build this you could just build it uh the new set of platforms that we have are doing this gatekeeping role and they're doing it primarily uh to make sure that you know they have your attention they have your data etc uh the antidote to this is something called interoperability which basically means that you know if let's say um I'll, I'll give this example in the book email you can send an email from gmail to hotmail there is nobody stopping you it, it just works uh but you can't send a message from whatsapp to signal now email was invented 40 50 years ago um and whatsapp came out what last decade you can't seriously believe that it's a technology that does not allow us it is a clear cut business decision to keep the network closed because that is how the what everything we spoke about on the value investment side is growth network effects that's the kind of company they like right and so it's been designed primarily for getting money from investors and you know promising them riches it has not been designed for the consumer and what is good for us so if we start becoming a little more articulate about what is good design pattern what is bad design patterns right um and saying that hey you capturing all my data or you only selling me chargers yourself and not you know open charge sort of a open standard or a design where you know all of us can use the same charger uh, this by the way is is such an issue that i don't know if you know this but both eu and now i think the us has a draft it's come with an actual bill an actual law which says all devices must use the same usb c charger this is this is an actual law in the eu right now um and they're talking about a right to repair which means that you know you can't you can't only offer me replacements and cost me more money you should i should have the right to repair my device and reuse them um all of these choices if we can understand and more people are aware of i really believe that uh, we can solve this uh, interoperability is a big sort of blow to the current business model of capture um and uh, what gives me hope i'm just going to finish with this is that in india we've actually demonstrated this we've actually demonstrated uh, this with some with upi upi is an interoperable network uh, it is doing 6 billion uh, payments a month which by the way is more than anywhere else in the world by 50% so china is the next biggest and they are not doing sort of you know uh, they're doing about 3/4 or a little volume than that so um 3 2/3 sorry so they're they're you know they're less than 2/3 of our volume uh mobile fast payments um and upi is interoperable at some point of time google pay with all its cashbacks used to be number 1 and recently phone pay has climbed back 
Um, and this competition, I expect to keep going. WhatsApp is now getting into the mix. So uh, an interoperable network really allows for people to compete on merits rather than compete on how many people did I capture? So yeah, I, I, I hope that gives you some hope. Yeah. I know it doesn't sound very uh, easy, but uh, we genuinely believe it can happen. Yes, small rays of hope uh, yes. here and there. So that's 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 definitely uh, good for all of us to know. So switching gears now to what we can do as individuals. So yes, while we want to collectively hopefully keep working on these systemic and cultural changes, if we want to improve our own lives and improve our well-being, we do need to start being more mindful in how we use technology. And in the book, I know you talk about some core principles behind yeah. the art of bitfulness. Can you yeah. can you give us a sense of what those are and how we can put those into action? I mean, okay. The simplest one is uh, do not blame yourself for not having the willpower to not look away from your screen, etc. It's very hard. Uh, you know, even when you go on a diet, I think one of the first things that people tell you is, uh, you know, either cut down and it's like, you know, it's mentally a lot easier to say, I will simply not eat sugar or I will simply not eat certain things than it is to try and moderate, right? Because you're then having to make that decision about should I use it, should I not use it, what should I use it for all the time. Uh, when it comes to our devices, unfortunately for most of us, um, you will have to use them at some point in time. You will need your phone, you will need to you know, order groceries, maybe do something. Um, so the, the real answer is, how do I make sure um, I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Not that I cut down screen time or reduce or don't look at my phone at all, but when I want to be, let's say, spending time with friends, how am I actually making sure I'm spending time with friends rather than you know, looking at my phone? Or if I'm working, I'm actually working on what I need to be doing. Um, this is where you should embrace what the tech companies have embraced, that you are lazy. You are going to only do the most convenient thing. And you're going to do, you know, whatever is uh, sort of most handy and whatever is the first thing available to you. Um, in this way, change your habits by changing your environment. And by this is one is your physical environment. Uh, uh, this, you know, the, the best hack that I actually like caused me the most peace, I would say, is that my charger is, is plugged in here, which is my desk. My bed is downstairs. Um, so, you know, at night, your phone is dying. You want to charge it. You come here, you put it on charge. You go to bed, you don't have a device on you. You are not staying awake longer to uh, to scroll and you're not checking it first thing in the morning. It's it's sometimes it's something that simple by changing your physical environment helps. The other is you can change your digital environment. If you look closely and hard at what exists on your computer and on your phone, in what mode. Um, so one thing that I strongly recommend is on your laptop also, for example, if, if you find yourself distracted when you're there, you know, you're supposed to check you're supposed to write some document, but you will find yourself not on Facebook because you take yourself seriously, but you will start checking your email, right? You might start, maybe if you have Slack, you start doing Slack then because, you know, it's much easier to like respond to a colleague than to actually sit down and finish that one piece of work that only you are supposed to do. So we all have that procrastination at, at various degrees, right? Some of us um, will base it on Facebook or Instagram. Some of us will sort of just use email as an excuse to not get to it. What I find uh, useful and what we've written about in the book is that you want to separate your um, your boundary, you want to create boundaries in your devices, not based on work or home, because those are not as solid categories as you think they are, right? Um, you want to divide them based on the quality of attention you want to give. So when you're writing a document, when Bhavna, let's say you were preparing it, and I must say excellent questions for these interview, right? And the flow, you need it alone time, you need it quiet, you need non-disturbed time, right? When I was writing, I needed that kind of attention. Um, so have a mode on your computer. And by this, I mean, genuinely create a new user, right? Just create a new login. Uh, it'll, it'll act like a whole new computer. And on this whole new computer, only install those tools and, and things that you need to do focused work. Do not install email, do not install or like open or have in your browser any social media, etc. You can even block these sites actively. Once you create these modes on your computer, every time you open it, uh, you'll be presented with a choice. What do you want to do right now? Am I here to quickly check my email, message some colleagues in Slack and like be in that kind of, you know, 
not not focused but not distracted either sort of just responding responsive kind of mode but am i here to do deep work in which case i will log into my deep work profile and you know um for an hour and a half i will actually do what i'm supposed to do not get said do anything else the reason why we found that this works and we tried with a bunch of people is because um honestly you know if if everything is a click away you won't even realize it it's like if any of you were smokers you know this that um you know most smokers will complain that they don't even realize when they lit that cigarette right it's such an involuntary action to reach into your packet and like put one in and light that cigarette you only realize it after like oh when did i light this right and it's the same with checking emails the same with checking facebook the same with all our distractions we do it so involuntarily and so instinctively that unless you create these boundaries um is going to be very hard for you to recover so honestly those if you are now that we've had about 6 months 4 to 5 months since the books come out we've gotten feedback i think these physical environment and digital environment boundaries have been the most successful sort of tricks that people gave us um uh, sort of came back and said that is the ones that worked the most um and other than that honestly you know uh, every time you find yourself sort of doing something on your phone that you don't want to do or on your device you don't want to do just honestly ask yourself why right because there's no hack there's no sort of thing is self knowledge it's, it's knowing why i am doing this which is going to help you more than what is the technique to not do that brilliant what i love about all of the solutions you've shared is that it's it's coming first and foremost from a place of acceptance of both the nature of our mind or our brain as well as the nature of technology and it's working with that rather than against it it literally leveraging uh how things are uh and and using them to work in our favor uh rather than um rather than falling prey to these forces that that seem so so strong in fact one of my favorite quotes from from your book uh is around working with uh designing our environment and if i could just read this out because i love this if we design our environment around who we are instead of who we wish we were we can guide ourselves towards making healthier choices automatically yeah yeah i i mean it isn't it true i feel like uh i my to do list from a few years ago used to be um more ambitious than i am right like i will mean, the, the the things we set out to do the things we believe we will do um we be really overestimate what we're going to achieve in a day or in whatever but at the same time we we you know don't appreciate enough the sort of compounding effect of consistency of just taking a simple step and doing it you know consistently it might be boring it's not life changing um um i get this the, the reaction that i love the most is uh, so i've recently lost a lot of weight right so i lost about 30 kilos and then people ask me who not seen me in a while and say uh, they they ask me what do you do and i said i just you know i ate a simpler diet and i ate it on time and their first reaction is that's it right and uh, i i always get perplexed by that because it's, it's not easy to stick to a diet and to like actually stick on time so it's not so they they are underestimating even that simple habit etc but at the same time they refuse to believe that something so simple just done consistently and over time can have such a profound effect right um, and i think that's that's all of our problems we all keep looking for uh, a holy grail or a secret or you know uh, a very buzz feed like here are 10 things or here are four things that will you know make you elon musk or something like that um but none of them is going to work right like uh, there's, there's another line in the book which sort of i used to introduce the section on individual change it says that you don't need a hack you don't need hacks you need a system and this system only works if it's designed around you it's you know my system is my system but sort of what works for you is will uh, what will help you um so i i hope the book acts as some sort of a um uh, guide for people to create their own system rather than like my here's my system that will work for you guaranteed results of money back I, i'm i'm making no such claims yes yes and and, and in fact i i do love that you make that point as well that it's not about limiting our our use or going on a digital detox but 
based on how whatever our consumption patterns are how can we make these small changes as you said yeah. to come from a more healthier place or a more mindful place so we can have a better uh, relationship with technology brilliant um tanuj what is the next thing that is most exciting for you and for anyone who's watching or listening to this if they want to support your movement around mindful use of technology uh how can they help so honestly i uh, to me um I, i'll tell you i mean it's it's not going to be coherent right like what i'm about to tell you is not going to be um i wrote a book so now i have a podcast and i have a course and i'm i'm doing none of those things because i'm really not doing this um to make um uh, money out of this and honestly writing a book is uh you know there are various other ways in which you can sort of make more money and do this is genuinely because we wanted to talk about this uh and at least i wanted to put a stake in the ground and say you know look this is where we are and it's not healthy right and i wanted to make that point um what i'm doing next what i'm hoping to do next is that um i'm trying to um uh, uh, counter a very specific emotion that i find on social media happens which is that um uh, most social media right is is uh, or most people who are influencers or whatever they are um they try to show you a a very very sort of uh polished life right like so if you look, if, you, if you follow a fitness influencer they're already at like you know like they're like they're out there they're really doing it um if you you know they, they can lift whatever they eat and they can do so much etc um you go yoga right and there are people who are doing headstands all over the place etc like uh, fashion influencers they have everything um i think somewhere in that right it it and we know this we've seen research facebook the papers that came out last year it pushes a lot of negative self image right like because people really think that they can't do this and you know uh oh i'm not good enough i'm not hot enough i'm not whatever enough i'm not funny enough I'm, i can't dance well enough it's mostly that self assertion right um so my personal project for the next few months is that i'm trying to start a page where i take things that i am essentially shit at like really really bad at um and i'm just going to do it till i get better like like you know like to a reasonable degree um and i'm going to document or trying to document that part of the journey right that um that actually you you know if you put in the hours um and you put in the effort it it goes somewhere and people want to document you know just the end or maybe even if there's a change they want to document it as a montage and you know show that oh everything changed right so that i think somewhere culturally that that instant gratification sort of ideal from uh from social media the things where we compare ourselves to others right and we don't pay attention to the struggle right we don't pay attention to things that we have to go to um my if you're in this space if you're somebody who's young and listening and you, know, you want to be something you want to write a book maybe etc um or you want to do something else i i highly recommend to you you look at something called or hear something called the gap by ira glass uh it's a very short two and a half or three minute extract from an interview um where he says that um you know anybody who's in the creative profession they are there because they have taste you know what good art or good music or good writing looks like even though you can't produce it yourself this is the gap right you know what good looks like but you are not there yet um and the most important thing he says that nobody ever told him and he wishes that somebody would have told him would be that um uh, oh by the way ira glass is one of the most prolific producers of this american life radio show host is is just It's a phenomenal storyteller, right? So Ira Glass and national radio personality, right? Um, and he says that when he was younger, nobody told him that the only way to bridge the gap is to do a lot of work, is to put yourself on a deadline and produce and produce and produce and produce till you get good enough, till you start your 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 skill matches your taste, right? Um, then I think this is true of everything. Uh, there is this great clip of Ed Sheeran where. you read a ed sheeran is annoyed because everybody tells him you have such great talent you're you know you're so gifted and he's like no i'm not i used to be really really bad when i started and he plays an audio recording of himself singing uh, like you know way uh, when back when 
and uh, he genuinely is terrible in that clip right like he, he genuinely can't sing um so i think that's that's what's next for me like i really want to uh, i don't know how i'll do it where it's going to happen so i'm still figuring that out but i'm trying to sort of put this message out there that it is okay to be terrible at things because you can be better and you know um you just have to stick to it um which i think people don't realize anymore um um yeah that's that's probably was next okay. year yeah i don't know i don't know what i'm doing career wise this is my sort of personal project but um okay. yeah this is what it is I, i think that's fantastic because you're so right i think so many of us put so much pressure on ourselves to only reveal ourselves once we've mastered something or perfected something yeah. whereas in fact how you truly connect to your audience or to anyone is when you make yourself vulnerable yeah. and show yourself as a work in progress so yeah. hats off to you if you can pull that off and um, and inspire i'm sure you will inspire many others along the way Yeah, as you do that. So all the best to you, uh, Tanuj. Where can people find you or follow you and and join uh, this this movement? I I uh, I mean it's it's strange because I really don't do a lot on social media. But if I do something, I make it a point to at least tell people um, that I am. I'll be honest with you. I am uh, more than happy to have um, one to one conversation with people. So the best way to find me might be my email. If you just send an email to Tanuj at Bitfulness dot com, that's B I T F U L N E S S dot com. Um, if you just send an email, I'll probably reply. Um, and uh, but if you really want to, like, I am at Tanuj B on most social media on Twitter or on Instagram, etc. Um, uh, but beware, I I don't really post much or uh, you know or anything that might be of particular interest. I only post what captures my fancy, which is very weird. um so yeah but but if you can come find me on that uh, website um if you uh, you know i hope the book is of some relevance to the people who are listening in and uh, if you like the concept or talk about anything in there in particular then i'm more than happy to reply um on the email but even otherwise if you want to just shout about um maybe this project about getting better at social media right like getting better on social media yeah and social media i'd be happy to sort of talk to anybody about that Excellent. Final question for you Tanuj. One of the things we really emphasize with our work at Genomics uh when it comes to consciously living and leading is that you be very conscious about the values that you are living or leading with. So what would be a core value for you uh that you absolutely wouldn't compromise with something that is very central to how you live and lead? Um uh- I'm so that's a very deep question because you know when you think about this you have to be humble and say that it's not that I've always been true to it but I really really want to be able to be um considerate right like to be kind and to understand that your your perspective your world view your facts are not necessarily true for everybody else so um in every interaction have that amount of grace to be um you know fair to people to show uh, kindness they may not know something you know they may not have the same sort of culture or background values and and to really therefore be open and tolerant to you know, and have the patience for for any interaction because i i really feel um we lost that kind of patience for each other and you know and that that ability to really talk to somebody who's different than you and um, you know i i i genuinely believe everybody is inherently good i i don't know of people who are evil i know of people who are hurt but um, you know i don't think anybody is an evil or a bad person so um, sometimes you have to do a little work to find what is good about them beautiful and i i think your the ideas in your book are definitely will will definitely support people in being kinder in their interactions with each other online and and offline uh in all ways so uh highly encourage anyone who is listening to this to pick up the art of bitfulness i think it's it's such a relevant book for our times and for anyone who cares about our future individually and collectively it is such a great conversation to be a part of so tanish thank you so much it was such a pleasure speaking to you and wish you all the best with all the initiatives that you're going to be working on in the future 
um no thank you bhavna i i really appreciate that you took the time to be here and then pick out your best quotes etc um it, it, this is a really well done interview i again uh, congratulate you on sort of the uh, little world you created I, i honestly did not i only got a chance to interact with it recently but everything i've seen so far has been highly impressive um thank you again for having me and uh, best of luck my pleasure thank you so much